Well, Merry Christmas. I know many of you are probably looking forward to spending some time, um, maybe in smaller gatherings, but with some family here in the next couple of days. But we are having a Christmas Eve service at seven o'clock and uh, hope, hopefully many of you will be able to, to join us for that. We're having enough space so we can distance uh, as much as possible and yet continue to uh, celebrate the birth of Jesus, this very unique and special uh, Christmas season. If you're not able to join us, I just want to give you a bit of a Christmas meditation that I'm going to be sharing on Christmas Eve, and I hope this finds you well. Um, over the past four Sundays, we've been celebrating Advent, and we've been looking at one particular prophecy in the book of Isaiah. It's in Isaiah chapter 9, and I just want to read this for you here today. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. We've been looking at these four names that is just represented so well here in this prophecy. In the time of Isaiah, it was a time of political unrest, a time of economic chaos. It was a time of just seemingly very random happenings. And yet Isaiah gives this prophecy of hope of a child that is going to be born. And 800 years later... Again, we find the people of Israel in a very similar situation, different set of circumstances, but they find themselves in political unrest. Again, they find themselves in economic turmoil, a relational difficulty. You see, the times don't necessarily change that much, correct? And yet they found hope in one that was born, Jesus of Nazareth. And we've been looking at these four names, the wonderful counselor, he is help to the helpless, mighty God, he is hope to the hopeless, everlasting father, the one who is to come, right? The one who is Jesus gives a home to the homeless. And we've been looking at Prince of Peace. He gives peace to the soul, peace to the restless. I wanna focus a little bit here today as we just look at a passage of scripture that I'm sure um, you're probably familiar with. In fact, if you don't read Luke chapter uh, 1, chapter 2 over Christmas, can it really be Christmas? This is the Christmas account. And yet I want to begin actually with this gospel that this guy by the name of Luke writes because oftentimes we don't quite comprehend who Luke was and who Luke was originally writing this to. Luke was a guy who was sort of in the background of a lot of the major events, you know, in the scriptures. Uh, he was not so much a disciple, he was a follower of Jesus, but he wasn't one of the 12 disciples. He was a doctor. We know that he traveled with uh, the Apostle Paul on a lot of his missionary uh, journeys. He was just sort of in the background. He was not only a doctor, but in many ways he was a recorder. And the Holy Spirit directed this man uh, put gifts and abilities into his life, wired him in such a way in which he wrote an orderly account. In fact, if you have your Bible handy with you, this is how Luke begins his gospel account. He says this, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were the very first witnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, and then he gives a guy's name, Most Excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. This guy by the name of Theophilus, we know that Luke wrote uh, his gospel account to him. We also know that he wrote the book of Acts directly to him. And yet we have the benefit of sort of reading kind of the mail, right, of, of Luke sending this lengthy account of Jesus' life and also a lengthy account of the Acts of the very first early church. And so you see that Jesus, as he ministered on the earth, he taught, he performed miracles, he, he ministered to the disenfranchised, to the outcasts of society. And yet eventually, though, even though he claimed to be the Messiah and many people believed that he was, eventually the majority of people rejected him. And the reason why they rejected him is because of their perception of who the Messiah should be. You see, in their minds, when they, when they read the prophecies, when they heard the prophecies from Isaiah as well as, as the other Old Testament prophets, they believed errantly 
that the Messiah who would come would bring peace to their circumstances, that he would, he would create a, a home uh, and kick Rome out. He would make their outside situations much better. And yet Jesus' mission was very clear. He never promised that he would deal with all the outside stuff. He came for a mission of the heart. He understood that it was a prince of peace, the, 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 the peace to the soul. He understood a home for the homeless, a, a home that we find deep inside of ourselves that only Christ can provide, that he is the mighty God internal dwelling within us. And yet many people saw Jesus and one of his followers, Judas, eventually rejected him because Jesus did not fit in his mind and in other people's minds of who the Messiah ought to be. Theophilus, in many ways, I think he had heard about this Jesus. He had heard and the teachings of his followers who said that they had claimed to see the resurrected Jesus. And yet, because of the randomness and circumstances of life, he was a bit of a skeptic. Not in terms of a skeptic of hostile toward the message of Jesus, but just wanting to know a little more. He, we might even put him in the category of a bit of a a bit of a seeker, just wanting all the information that he possibly can get. And so what Luke does, he understands who he's writing to, and he says, Theophilus, I am going to do the best that I can. I'm going to write to you an orderly account of all the things that Jesus has done and all the claims that he has made so that you can have the most information that you possibly can, so you can make the best decision possible. And with this introduction that we just read, you would imagine that Luke would probably start to give facts. Facts about the fulfillment of the prophecies that, that Jesus fulfilled. And, you know, we see that in the Gospel of Matthew, but yet we don't see all of that in a way that we would expect that perhaps Luke would be writing to this guy by the name of Theophilus. In fact, right after he says, I am going to write an orderly account so that you can have as much information as you possibly can, he begins the Christmas story, which contains all kinds of random happenings to people. Then when they were happening to them, they were trying to make sense of sort of this randomness. And so I just want to highlight just a few of these, and perhaps you'll track with me as you are familiar with the Christmas story. There was a random sea of two unexpected pregnancies, right? We have, we have Elizabeth and Zechariah, and she was well advanced in her years, unable to have children barren, and yet this unexpected pregnancy of John the Baptist in her womb, that pregnancy was celebrated. Finally, God was faithful, right? Then there was another unexpected pregnancy, Mary. This was an unexpected pregnancy. In fact, Mary says, how can this be since I'm a virgin? She was pledged to be married to Joseph. That pregnancy wasn't so much celebrated. Instead, it was probably looked at with some controversy and scorn and a little bit of a shame, right? We have an unexpected census, right? That, that Joseph had to go to his hometown of Bethlehem and register. It was a nice excuse to get them to pay their taxes, right? So we have this unexpected trip that Joseph takes, and by the way, he takes Mary as well. We have unexpected accommodations. We, we read in the Gospel account of Luke that there, were no, there was no room for them at the end, and so unexpectedly they had to go to this stable. We have unexpected witnesses, don't we? We have an angel and the heavenly host appearing to random shepherds in a field that weren't even owners of these sheep. In fact, they were sort of considered the outcasts of society. You did not aspire to be a hired hand shepherd. In fact, their testimony in a court of law was not even admissible. They were, uh, they were not even allowed to go into the temple. They were, the, they were the, the, the discounted and disenfranchised people, and yet... These were the first random witnesses of the Christ child. In the book of Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, we have random violence, don't we? We have Herod the Great issuing this horrible decree because he, he believes that the prophecy of the, the Christ child has, has occurred, and so he's going to retain his power and the horrible account of what happened to male Israelite babies two years and under. We have a random dream that Joseph experiences that says to that says to uh, him uh, escape Herod is on the prowl and they randomly go to Egypt and then he has another dream and and randomly goes back after Herod the Great has passed we also have another random dream in Joseph saying 
don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. In fact, there's so many dreams that Joseph had, you, you wondered when he put his head down, oh my goodness, here comes another dream. You have all these random events that seemed so random to the people in which they were occurring to in real time. And yet when you look back at the scriptures, when you look back at the prophecies, everything that I just mentioned was prophesied about. It seemed random to the people and how it was occurring and, and the timing and, and what is going on, does God have a plan? But yet you look back on it, all of these things that I just mentioned were perfectly planned out in God's timing. And here's Luke telling these random events to a guy by the name of Theophilus who's just trying to make sense of sort of the randomness in his own life as well. And then after that, he talks about these random things that happens. He says, but also at the same time, there are some reassurances that, that Luke is giving to Theophilus. And he talks about this in terms of Mary. Follow with me as we read from Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Do you see some of the reassurances, the promises of God in this seemingly random kind of event here? Mary was greatly troubled, this is verse 29, at his words, and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, again, here's the reassurances. Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive, and you will give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. You see, in the midst of the randomness of life and this seemingly interruption in the life of Mary, when an angel appears to her and says, this is what's going to happen, there were reassurances that the angel gave to her. All of these, this will happen. This will occur. Mary, you are highly favored. Mary, the Lord is with you. Mary, do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive. He will be great. He will reign forever. In the middle of our randomness, of our lives and some of the things that seem like interruptions we do understand that if you are a believer in Jesus God does have a plan and yet at the same time we may not always understand exactly how God is going to fulfill the ultimate plan but we hold on to the reassurances of his promises here are some of the promises so these are just random right from the scriptures God loves us God is in control God cares for us. God is working out his plan for the best. We place our faith and our trust in him that no matter what happens, it is well with our soul. We are given the promise and the reassurance of his Holy Spirit. We are given the reassurance and the promise of the people of God to come around us. All the one another's of scriptures, love one another, be kind to one another, serve one another, be gentle to one another, teach one another, pray for one another, bear with one another. All of these reassurances within the body of Christ. Perhaps you're experiencing some randomness in 2020. Ha ha, that's a little bit sarcastic. I think we all know there's been some things that we didn't expect to happen this year. And yet we, we do not place our faith in, and trust in everything coming out and working out according to how we believe that should work out, but we place our faith and our trust in the reassurances of the promises that God has given us. And not only did he give us reassurances in the randomness of life, but also, and I'm going to read it in just a moment, starting in verse 34 of Luke chapter 1, there was a resource that was given to Mary. Let me read it, starting in verse 34. How will this be? This is right after the angel says, you will give birth to a son. He will be high, uh, called the son of the most high. All these scriptures that I just read a moment ago. We pick up the story again, verse 34. How will this be? She was looking for a 12-step type of a list of how this will occur. Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. And this is how the angel answered Mary. 
The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Well, thanks for the answer to that question. Here's Mary, she's wondering, how am I going to be pregnant since I've never been with a man? Since, since I am a virgin? And this is how the angel answers her. It's not so much in terms of the specifics of how, but in the specific of who. Let me tell you, Mary, how this is going to happen. Not so much how, but who. She says, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word of the Lord will ever fail. Mary was given the resource of the Holy Spirit. And the angel actually points to the resource of the Holy Spirit in the life of her aunt, Elizabeth. What man can't do, God can do. When I think of the resource of the Holy Spirit that was given to Mary, I listed a few things. And this is how she was empowered to do what she was called to do. The Holy Spirit came upon her. She became pregnant to fulfill what God was calling her to do. There was a practical, uh, a practical uh, part of this Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit brought her Joseph in her life. She also, the Holy Spirit brought her Magi from the East after a couple years after Jesus was born, gave him gifts that no doubt probably financed in a very practical way their escape to Egypt and in their eventual return. The Holy Spirit enable, enabled her to have inner strength to endure scorn and ridicule and gossip and how to raise this special child in the controversy surrounding her pregnancy. The Holy Spirit resourced her with wisdom far beyond her years. The Holy Spirit gave her endurance and peace. There's a part of the scripture that I didn't read here today, but Mary was told that the child inside of her would cause the rising and the falling of many in Israel, and that a sword too would pierce her own soul. How did Mary endure all this? Well, the scripture says she pondered all of things, these things in her heart. She was resourced by the Holy Spirit. How do we endure the randomness of life? How do we, how do we pick up on the reassurances that God gives us in, the, in, in his promises of his word? How, how, do we, how do we impact and implement the, the resource of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Well, Mary was just told, this is how it's gonna happen. And she questioned about the how, but the Holy Spirit, the angel told her, the Holy Spirit, it's the who. I can't tell you how uh, God is going to resource you, how God is going to uh, cause you to have endurance and perseverance and, and, and joy in spite of your circumstances. Perhaps 2021 will be better. Perhaps 2021 will be a repeat of 2020. Perhaps 2021 will be even more difficult. But I do know this. It is the power of the who. And who is, who is it? It is the resource of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may his face shine upon you. And Merry Christmas. God bless.